Now, if you're wondering what exactly I meant by that, this is a day that I am never going to forget. You see, this Sunday began well, really like a lot of other ones. That I woke up with just a whole bunch of things that I needed to do. And, you know, there was some business I had to take care of out in the village. There were all the animals out in the front yard that needed to be fed. And, like many others, I had a bunch of preparations I still needed to make for the upcoming Passover festival. Well, you know, at least I had it fairly easy. Some Jews had to travel well over a hundred miles just to get to Jerusalem. And they did not have those planes, trains, and automobiles like I see that you have today. Would you believe they all walked? A trip like that could take over a week. But my house, it was only a few miles away. So at this time of the year, I would often see a steady stream of people going by on all the roads that went into Jerusalem. But this day, it was different. There was an excitement in the air. I could sense it, but I couldn't fully explain what was going on. Maybe the crowds were larger than usual. You know, I didn't quite realize it that morning, but even my life was about to change. This morning, all the promises that had been made in the Old Testament about a Savior, a Messiah, a promised one, would come to life right before my eyes. I saw the promised Savior on a day that shares its name with all those branches that I saw you hanging outside and as you came down the center aisle this morning. I want to share my joy with you about this day. I want you to raise your voices with me and praise God for Palm Sunday. As the sun began to peek over the horizon early that morning, I loaded up my donkey to take it into the village. There was a chance while I was there that I might pick up a, a few more things than I'd be able to put on one donkey. So I brought her little colt along just to be safe. Now, she was not to be ridden. At least, not yet. But she was strong enough to carry at least a few things in the pouches off her side. Now, after the short trip into the town, I tied the animals to a post and went about to do my business for the day. Well, it's a good thing it didn't take me too long, because when I came back, I saw two men untying them. Now, at first, I thought, wait a minute here. They're trying to steal my animals. But they were doing it so slowly and so carefully, it almost looked like they were the rightful owners. I didn't know what to do. So I asked them, uh, why are you untying the colt? Now, they weren't the least bit startled or surprised by that. In fact, it was as if they knew the question I was going to ask them even before I asked it. They simply replied, the Lord needs it. They gave me their word that they would return those animals shortly. Now, these men were complete strangers to me. I'd never seen them before. I didn't know where they'd come from or where they were going. And losing these two animals set me back quite a bit of money, but I let them go. I was curious to see where they were going and who this Lord was that needed them so bad. The two men then led the donkey and her colt to a larger group of men, and uh, some of them put their coats on the animals. And then one of them sat on that young colt that had never been ridden before. Now this was strange. You would think that that little colt would have immediately tried to buck the rider right off. But no, he made it look so easy. He sat on that colt as if he were its loving master. And the colt didn't seem to mind one bit. It reminded me of this Bible passage from Zechariah that I had been taught back when I was a boy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! 
Shout aloud, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Now, as this group made its way to Jerusalem, I wondered aloud, is this just coincidence? Or am I in the presence of greatness today? I had so much I had to do back home, but I was interested here. What's going on? I couldn't let this man out of my sight. <coughs> Who knew what would happen next? Now, because there were so many others on the road, I just blended right in with the crowd. That was, until one of those travelers just about ran me over. He grabbed onto me to keep from falling, and then yelled, Oh, I'm sorry, it's so good to see you. Now, um... I've never met this man before. I had no clue who he was. Oh, my name is Bartamus, he said as he brushed himself off. I'm from Jericho, and until just a few days ago, I was blind. I was sitting by the road, begging for money one day, when I heard this noise. A crowd was headed in my direction, so I asked someone, well, what's going on? They told me, well, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. Now, um, I would heard of this man before. It was said that he could do miracles. And since I had absolutely nothing to lose, I went ahead and yelled out to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, some people were pretty embarrassed by me. Others tried to silence me. But do you know that Jesus stopped and listened? He said, so what do you want me to do for you? Without hesitation, I replied, Rabbi, I want to see. Then he spoke those precious words to me that I will never forget. Go, your faith has made you well. And immediately, my eyes were opened. And I have been following him ever since. That man then disappeared into the crowd just as quickly as he came out. Now, I really don't know if, if I should believe him or not. I did know one thing, though. I couldn't turn back now. And I wanted to follow this man, you know, wherever he was going. But I needed to learn much, much more about him. So I went up to a woman who was seated on the side of the road. Uh, Do you know this man? Who is he? The one that they called Jesus. With a big smile, she said, yes, I do. Her name was Martha. And Jesus had been staying with her and with her sister Mary. She told me of her brother Lazarus, who had died recently. I was going to share my sorrow for the loss in her family when she very suddenly stopped me. I could tell by the look in her eyes there was a lot more to this story. She believed that this man had the power to heal her sick brother. But when Lazarus died, she thought it was too late. She knew she would see him again in heaven. She had no doubt about that. But man, that sting of death, it's all too real and too powerful. And Jesus himself wept when he saw his friend Lazarus' tomb but he was not ready to accept it. Even though Lazarus had been dead for four days, Jesus asked that the stone be rolled away from the entrance, and in a loud, commanding voice, he said, Lazarus, come out! He did. Linen strips, burial cloth, and everything. He was alive. Now I was beginning to understand the excitement of the people who had come to celebrate this Passover. They had all heard amazing stories about Jesus. But now, they had proof. Lazarus was a living, breathing illustration of this man's power. This Jesus was really different. And now, he's on his way into Jerusalem. And as Jesus began his final descent into the valley, the crowds kept growing larger and larger. They were treating him like a king. 
they threw their coats on the road, and they waved palm branches in the air. Together they shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <coughs> Before I knew what was going on, I was right there in the middle of the procession. Inside the gates of the city, it was crazy. The mood of the people was joyful. Children were singing. Travelers were praising him. But there was not everybody that was real happy about this. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, were visibly upset. They came to Jesus and demanded, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Why were they so angry? Why would they want the people to stop? And that's when Jesus said, I tell you, if they kept quiet, even the stones would cry out. <laughs> well, let me tell you, stones didn't have to make any noise on that day. Gradually, the crowds began to scatter and the people went back home. As I retraced my route home, I began to think about everything that I had seen on that day. I knew something special had happened, but I wasn't sure what it was. This prophet from Nazareth obviously was a special guy, but I wasn't sure just who he was. As I walked through the front door of my house, I wondered if my questions would ever be answered. But then an hour later, I heard a knock on the door. It was those two disciples, and they were returning the donkey into her colts. I invited them in and started asking them all kinds of questions. Who is this Jesus? Who is this one you call Lord? What does all the stuff that happened today mean? Well, the disciples admitted they didn't have all the answers. They had been with Jesus for over two years by this point, but they still had questions of their own. But one of them shared with me a very interesting thing this Jesus had said to them earlier on. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and then turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised to life. Now that didn't look or sound anything, what I had seen that morning. But then again, nothing was as it appeared on that first Palm Sunday. Jesus was hailed as a king, but he rode into town on the back of a donkey, a simple beast of burden. Jesus was treated like a winning general. I didn't see an army, just 12 disciples. Jesus accepted the praise of the adoring crowds, but he also knew those praises were not going to last. But there was one other thing that really, really bothered me. Jesus knew exactly where my donkey was, and even what I was going to ask. So, he knows the future. That means he knows exactly what's waiting for him later this week. But, if he already knows about the betrayal from those who love him the most, if he knows that he's going to be unjustly condemned, and if he knew about that mocking, that flogging and crucifixion, why? Why would he go into Jerusalem? I think I know. He did it for me. He did it for you. He did it to a world that's lost, that's dying in its brokenness, that needs a Savior. He did it so that you would not be lost to a God who loves you unconditionally forever. And even though it would mean an extraordinarily painful, embarrassing death, He did it for all of us. He did it because He loves you unconditionally. He would give every last thing he had to draw you to himself. <clears throat> you see, Jesus knew that without Palm Sunday, there could be no Good Friday or Easter. So he willingly 
And he lovingly set his face towards Jerusalem and the cross that he knew was lying ahead. He would complete his father's work of dying and rising again to take away our brokenness, our sin, our failures. You see, this is my story, but it's also your story. Today, followers of Jesus all around the world are waving palm branches in the air. Today, we worship the King and shout, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God for this Palm Sunday, his coming death on the cross, but even more so, that unbridled joy and celebration we will have next Sunday as we come together and as we celebrate our Lord's <coughs> victory over death, Satan, and hell. Death does not have the final say in our lives. Instead, it's the victory of life with Jesus. And that's what we walk through together in this holy week. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all of our human